large cup here look hi everybody welcome back to cup of tea with the vet we have got martin whitehead here from chipping norton veterinary hospital and oh my god i am so excited about this because i'm thrilled to learn a different side of veterinary so come on get involved if you guys want to know anything about um exotics vetting um and the wild side of veterinary please ask we've got so much to talk about um and um so martin please introduce yourself well, hello there. So I'm Ian Martin and I am one of the directors and a, a vet at Chipping Norton Veterinary Hospital, which is in northwest Oxfordshire. And we are a dog and cat and pet vet, uh, but we do a, a few of the unusual things as well. We, we are very into exotics um, and all the reptiles and the birds. Uh, and we cover a few zoos as well. That uses up quite a bit of our time. And uh, among other things, we have a CT scanner. So we do a lot of that sort of outpatient CT scanning. And sometimes we end up fixing the things that we find on the CT scanner for other practices. Um, and we also run a radio iodine unit for hypothyroid cats. There we go, that's us. That's lovely. That I mean, there's so much, so much to talk about. So I'm going to try and work my way through this. Um, but I'm really excited for you to share, you know, what zoos um, that you actually end up doing the veterinary work for, because it's also it's really nice for the general public to realise how cared for zoo animals are, because obviously it's something that people do worry about. Um, so, you know, you guys are the, the team that look after them and keep them all well. Um, so, yeah, who is it you're looking after? Yeah, well, some of the, the bigger zoos um, have their own vet teams. Um, so Bristol and Chester and London Zoo and such like, they've, they've got large groups of people on site all the time. Um, but many of the smaller zoos can't really afford to have a vet team on site all the time. Uh, so they use private practice vets. Uh, and, and there's a, a, I mean, there's a company or a veterinary practice called the International Zoo Veterinary Group up in um, Yorkshire. And, uh, they, they provide veterinary services to zoos, not just in England, but around the world. Uh, but we are quite lucky to have several zoos locally. Um, so we have um, Crocodiles of the World. We have the Cotswold Wildlife Park, who do have one vet on site, but we do a lot of work for them too. Um, there's uh, Birdland Park and Gardens, which is in Bolton on the Water. Uh, we look after the Cotswold Falconry Centre. Uh, and we look after a place called Heathrop Zoo, which is, is actually not open to the public, but uh, has a collection of animals for mostly used in film and television work. And wow. we do call on Safari Park, which isn't particularly local. It's about an hour and 15 minutes drive from us. That's amazing. So you've just taken me straight on to my question. I, I had this complete side note to ask um, because this is the most random pigeon you've ever seen in your life. Well, it's the most random pigeon I've ever seen in my life. So I'm really curious to find out because this pigeon has just moved into my mum's. It's so bonkers. And for some reason, it's really friendly. Don't even know why. Um, I don't think it's um, a, a, a flight pigeon, you know, a home a, homing pigeon um but he flies up onto the windowsill and he walks into the neighbor's window and then goes around the bedroom and then walks out and that's bizarre and then he flies down to the patio and i've literally watched him i wish i could show you but i would look crazy as if i did he will walk forwards and then like go whoa like he's seen some really scary ghost and then walk backwards turn around a little bit and then walk forward and do the same thing again like whoa and he'll do that for about an hour and I and then you and then you walk you go out there you say are you all right mate and he stands there and he might vibrate vibrates and it's like well that doesn't seem right and then he doesn't move doesn't go anywhere and you can sort of sit next I sat next to him for about half an hour having a chat I did look like the crazy pigeon lady but I just thought you're not right any ideas I, I agree with you it doesn't sound right maybe he was <laughs> brought up by somebody so he's not scared of people I and mean, you know pigeon squabs that chicks um get a uh, quote rescued from nests or whatever um so he might have been bought at by somebody but yeah he certainly sounds like he's got something going on with his brain doesn't he i was once uh, walking along the edge of paul harbour near where my mum lives uh and uh, there's a seawall and the, the tide comes right up to the seawall and i looked over and there was a cormorant swimming around and i just walked on down and the cormorant was just swimming alongside and i kept walking and kept walking and kept walking. And that eventually, after a few hundred yards, there was a little set of steps down into the water. And the cormorant got on the steps and popped up the steps and came and said hello. 
<laughs> animals <laughs> are basically asking for fish. It must have belonged to someone at some point because I thought I'd say to as well, sorry, mate, I haven't got any fish. And it just went off. What I love is animals are so awesome and they're so they, you know, they keep you on their toes. You know, you always see these random stories. I love these stories. And also I love how much us animal people are so like obsessed with them that we can't help but have a conversation with them when we find these cases. I um there was one that I was in my uh on my honeymoon and we were in the Maldives and I went for a really early morning walk around the beach and um there was a, a ray, like a, a stingray. I was really in the shallows. I was shocked. I was just paddling around and I thought, well, if you want to walk with me, all right then. We must have walked and him swum for a little while. And my dog's called Logan and I was missing him. So I said, oh, you're my Rogan the Ray. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that was my little crazy Ray story. But, um, yeah, no, that's amazing. I bet you've got so many awesome stories to, to tell about all these things. But I want to hear a bit more about your um, cat radiotherapy as well, because I, I remember learning about that when I was um, a student nurse and I was always quite amazed. But I'd actually never come across anyone that actually has a radio unit for thyroid cats. Um, so, yeah, please tell a bit more about it. because I think it's really important because hyperthyroidism is so common in cats as well. Yeah, I, th I think it's probably becoming more common as well. But there's oh. uh, um, maybe 15 centres in the country doing this now. It's certainly something that seems to be um, getting more popular. Um, uh, we've been doing it for about three years, just over. And we've probably treated about 250 cats in that time. Wow. And uh, we're not, we, we can do four cats at a time. We're actually expanding the unit at the moment. Um, and uh, it's, it's regarded veterinarily as the sort of gold standard treatment because it doesn't involve any surgery. Uh, it's a pretty easy thing for the cats. It's just a simple, very small injection in the back of the neck, it's just like having a vaccination for the cat. And the radiation doesn't feel like anything, so it's not uncomfortable for the cat at all. But obviously, because they're radioactive and we're not allowed to expose members of the public to radiation, they have to stay. Um, we, we've got a, a special sort of screened unit at the back of our hospital and they have to stay in there for up to 10 days in our case. Um, oh. so we go home quite a bit earlier than that. Um, but many cases, many places, there's, there isn't a, a sort of fixed rule as to how long they have to stay in. Uh, and the time they stay in is provided by a professional called a radiation protection advisor. He's given us a set of rules for when they can go home. Um, and, and different radiation protection advisors give different people different times. Uh, so we, we've got one of the shorter hospitalizations. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really it's, it's really interesting. Is it very similar to how humans have the radio the radiotherapy? Yeah, it's it's very similar. In humans, they they usually I think they usually have a capsule uh, and swallow it, uh, and you can do that in cats as well. But you've got the problem of getting the capsule in the cat. Yeah, uh, it bites it or spits it out. You might get a little radiation everywhere. So it, it's better just to inject it. Um, and you can inject it intravenously too. But obviously, it's a bit easier just to do it in the um, scruff of the neck. Uh, and um, obviously, I knew it worked or I wouldn't have opened a radio iodine unit, but I have been so impressed with how, how effective it's been. It's extremely rare that it doesn't work. It's really good. And obviously, this is something that tends to be diagnosed in older cats. So is there sort of a max age that you would do? Or do you just check, you know, depending on their general health, then it's acceptable whatever age? Yeah, if, if they're healthy apart from their hypothyroidism or, or don't have any sort of severe disease, any age. I've certainly treated 18, 19 year old cats. Wow. Um, I, I also get the impression, I don't know if it's true, that cats tend to be being diagnosed a bit younger. I'm treating quite a lot of 9, 10, 11 year old cats. And in fact, one of the cats in the unit at the moment is only six. Oh, wow. And it, it is extremely hyperthyroid. Um, wow. So if someone wanted to access this, would it be a case of just talking to their vet and um, and then, you know, uh, discussing it? Are you, are you like a second opinion, like referral centre? Yeah. or we, we require a referral. Members of the public often just phone us up. They find us on the internet and we say, well, go and talk to your vet and uh, send them to us. Uh, Lovely. If you're a long, long way from Jimmy Norton, there's, there's other radio iodine centres are available, as they say on television. Yeah, no, no, that's just really interesting for people to know, because obviously, like I say, it is such a common thing that, you know, I'm sure that people will be thinking, oh, actually, well, how do I do that? So um, that's really good. So talk to your vets, know that it's out there, know that it's available, because, you know, 
if you've got a family member who's had it for themselves, like in the human world, you'll probably be thinking, well, why isn't this available for my cat? So, you know, which I, I always think, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to acknowledge from the human perspective as well, because when people have been through these things themselves, then they do expect these same things for their animals as well. So um, it's, it's really nice to know when it is mirrored and when it is available. So, uh, yeah, That's very interesting. Cats who belong to people who've had radioiodine treatment. So I also want to get to know a bit more about you, because it's really nice to um, learn the human side of these vets and not just, you know, all their clinical stuff, which is always lovely. But it's always just nice to know a bit more about the human that's actually treating our pets. Um, so what do you like to do in your spare time? Well, I actually spend quite a lot of time um, doing not work, but veterinary related projects. I, I have some um, research projects on the go and, and I do a fair bit of writing um, papers, and reviews and that sort of thing for the veterinary journals and such like. So that uses up a bit of time. Uh, I do a bit of cycling to try and keep fit. Uh, and I like to read science fiction novels if I have a, if I have a bit of spare time. Uh, wow, you're so busy. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what's yeah. your latest bit of What's your latest bit of research? Because it sounds like you're basically veterinary through and through, which is really lovely. Um, so I'm glad you find some time for your cycling. But I'm always really curious as well. So what is your What is your latest research that you're doing? Um, well, there's, there's quite a number of projects on the go, actually. But um, we, we bought something called an ATP bioluminescence meter. Wow. It's a really cunning bit of kit. I'm glad I can talk to some other vets about this. Um, and it was developed for the National Health Service and other health services to try and um, reduce MRSA and Clostridium difficile um, infections in hospitals. It's a little handheld meter. It's about this big. You get a, a swab, which comes in a, a, a special liquid and you rub it on a surface, uh, and you put the swab in the liquid, which contains luciferase, which is the enzyme that makes bioluminescent fish glow. Yeah. Um, and if there's organic material on the surface that has ATP in it, the ATP activates the luciferase, there's a little light sensor detects the glow and gives you a number. So the number is proportional to the amount of ATP, which is proportional to the amount of organic matter on the surface, which is proportional to how badly cleaned it's been. Or how well wow. So you can actually objectively monitor your cleaning. When vets clean something, they clean it and then they look at it and go, oh, yeah, that looks clean. But that's actually not a very good way of assessing your cleaning. So with this, we can take the swab, choo, 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 put it in. 15 seconds, we have a number. There is going to be so many uh, cleaning obsessive people out there going, oh, my God, I want one. Um, and couldn't that oh, be better that timing? Nurses did a very nice project for us, which was going to be presented at the BSABA conference, which got cancelled. But um, we, we um, swabbed some standard places through our clinical areas of our hospital. And our nurses who do the cleaning knew this was going on, but they didn't know when we were doing measuring and wh where we were measuring. And um, we swabbed about... 10, 11 times over a few weeks. Then we changed our cleaning protocol and did it again. Big decrease in the numbers. Wow. Uh, those that are actually monitoring it can make a big difference. And there were places, I mean, we, we don't have any sort of problem. We don't have lots of infections or anything. But there were places, especially the toggle on top of the anesthetic machine. Oh, oh yeah. Cool. yeah. And despite the fact we thought we were cleaning pretty well. Uh, it's always really interesting isn't it because also you do you find you you get in a I don't want to say a rut but you know you have your mojo that you go around and you get faster and faster because you know that that's the route and if you don't have something within that route then yeah it's missed and and actually I think it's really you know it's really good that you're being so vigilant about checking things over because it's not even like you say it's not about having cases and constantly getting back, oh God, another infection. It's about just trying to improve and be better. And um, and that's really great. And, and as I say, I mean, it, the timing couldn't be better during COVID. I mean, that's just bonkers timing for you, isn't it? Because obviously everybody's obsessed with cleaning everything right now. So um, yeah, that's quite, that's impressive stuff. How exciting, that would be really good. Well, well you'll get- Tina's messed up stage two of this little project because we were going to other practices and measuring the same sorts of places in their practices to see how much variation there is. And we were going to some referral centres and some other practices um, so we could compare and get an idea of a sort of cleaning effectiveness throughout the profession. 
That is really interesting. That's really interesting. Well, congratulations. And I, you know, like I say, I, I hope that you get to present that properly um, at the BSAVA because that will be amazing. And I have no doubt that that will cause some um, lots of discussion, uh, especially amongst the nurses who are the ones who end up doing a lot of the cleaning. Um, so, yeah, no, that's really good. So I wanted to ask. Oh, and by the way, everybody watching, please ask questions. Get involved. We want some more input as well. Um, so yeah, what made you decide to be a vet? My wife. Because <laughs> you've got history in, in humans uh, research, haven't you? You're a researcher through and through. Yeah. So when I, um, I, I when I was a kid, I, I didn't really know vets existed. To be honest, I mean, sort of well, theoretically, I knew they were there, but I didn't know anything about them. We didn't have pets really in our family. There were actually we did have a couple of tortoises in the back garden, but in those days, you know, you didn't really much interact with the tortoise. Um, and uh, so I was doing research. I did a PhD and moved to America, and I was working in um, tertiary care university hospitals, studying how um, how ears work. We don't really know how ears manage to hear so sensitively, um, and how they can pick out different frequencies. It's it's quite an amazing structure in ear. Uh, so I was doing basic research into that, but also developing clinical tests, mainly to work out whether babies were deaf when they were born. Wow. I was doing this, most babies who were deaf at birth um, were actually not diagnosed as deaf until they're about two and a half years old. Because wow. it's not obvious whether a baby can hear and they start babbling doing that thing that babies do. But it's when they come to about two and a half, three years old, they should be talking. And it's when they didn't start actually saying words is when it was realized they were deaf. But by that time, a lot of their brain speech processing circuitry is, isn't developed because they've been deaf. So we wanted a way to diagnose deafness more or less at birth. And um, I studied, uh, ears actually produce sounds as well as hear sounds. They've got a mechanical amplifier built into them. And I used a little tiny miniature speakers and microphones to put a sound in and measure the sound that comes back out. And almost all deafness is down to that system not working properly. So we could diagnose wow. something like 99% of all deafness in babies a day or two old. And every baby in the Western world is screened using that test now. It wasn't just me who developed it. There were teams of people working on this at the time. Um, well, something to be proud of, though. So how in the world did that turn into veterinary, regardless of your wife? <laughs> well, um, the trouble with being a scientist um, is that uh, it... You can do it by being a university lecturer and do um, a bit of research in your spare time, uh, which I didn't really want to do. I'm, I'm not very keen on lecturing, to be honest. Um, so I was doing the full time research thing, but I had to fund you effectively sort of have to fund yourself. You have to be getting grants from mostly from government bodies or charities. Um, so you, you're sort of always living on the edge. You never know where the, you're going to get your next grant. Um, and over time, I and mean, when I started, it was great because I was employed by somebody else to do all the research and I was doing what I wanted to do. But you get to the stage where you're the person employing other people to do the research that you wanted to do in the first place. And you spend all your time writing papers and, and trying to get the next grant. Uh, I wasn't really enjoying that very much. And it was pretty stressful because if you didn't get the grant, it wasn't just you were out of the job, but your secretary and your lab tech and so on. Um, so I looked for something less stressful. Uh, and you picked veterinary. <laughs> I picked veterinary. It is a lot less stressful, I have to say. Wow. Uh, uh, so there are things that are worse. Um, and uh, I literally one day we just sat down and thought, OK, well, we don't want to do this anymore. What should we do? And we just got a book out and looked at all the different careers and thought, oh, actually, veterinary, yeah, we could probably live out in the country, which we wanted to do. And you make enough money for a decent living. It's interesting. Yeah, that's the one. Amazing. So is your wife a vet My as well? Huh? Is your wife a vet as well? Uh, 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 at that time, she was a teacher. Oh, I see. Oh, amazing. Well, that's amazing. So what brought you to the exotic side of it then? Uh, well, when I was working doing the hearing science, in the last couple of years I was working, because we developed this test to t tell if babies could hear without actually having to ask them whether they could hear, I'd get phone calls from people working on wild animals or something who wanted to know whether they could hear or not. Oh. Um, so I went to place our tested manatees. I went to California and we caught wild seals and sea lions 
because um, some people were worried about the sonic booms and the space shuttle used to come in and land at Edwards Air Force Base, make a lot of noise down the coast. Um, so we went there to test the hearing and such things. So I actually got a bit of an interest in wild animals. And I, I was thinking when I went to vet school, oh, well, maybe I'll be a zoo vet or a wild animal vet. Uh, but actually through the course, I got really interested in internal medicine is, the, is the, uh, one of the bits that most gets my interest. Um, and uh, then when I graduated, my first job was at the practice that in those days covered Chester Zoo. They didn't have their own in-house vet at the time. Uh, and I worked uh, for a couple, two, three months uh, at that practice, mostly covering Chester Zoo. And actually, I found it pretty dull. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So a lot of exciting stuff with zoo work, but actually a lot of it is just paperwork. Yeah. I can imagine, um, actually. I, I sort of decided fairly quickly that I didn't want to be a full-time zoo vet. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing now, well, we do a bit of zoo stuff, and we tend to do the more interesting stuff, to be honest, because we're not doing a lot of that paperwork and, so, and the routine checks. Uh, yeah. Combining that with doing my uh, in-practice internal medicine stuff, uh, that suits me. <laughs> oh no, that's perfect. So um with the sonic booms, was it a problem or was it not a problem? No, I, I to be honest, I could tell it was a problem long before I had uh, to tell it just wasn't loud enough that the scientists doing it didn't know that. I was a hearing scientist, so uh, but they had the money to do the tests and so we went and did the test. Well, then that's absolutely fine. And and you know, at least they've ticked that box and they can say no, nope, we checked and it's all okay. So that's perfect. So what's your what's your favorite part of being a vet now then? Uh, I like I, I like the variety, um, which is why and another reason why I like to do the zoos and the exotic animals, um, and I like uh, seeing I suppose you call it new things, not necessarily new to the world, but new to me. Um, yeah. I get a lot of that with uh, exotics and zoo work, things you've never seen before, um, and I like complicated medical cases. Trying to work out it's that that sort of detective type challenge of trying to work out what's wrong with this animal oh, i can well understand that that makes a lot of sense so yes no that that's absolutely fantastic so what pets have you got uh i've got two um golden retrievers uh trevor uh who, who is uh, i think it's about six coming up seven trevor the retriever obviously uh and elvis uh, Elvis is named after the uh, the swan in the film Hot Fuzz. I don't know if you've ever seen that film. Um, Do you know, I've heard of it, but I know I don't think I have seen it. I'll have to watch it now. The swan has a pretty key role in the film, and uh, I, I, we happen to know that swan. We used to treat him. Oh, amazing. Oh, well, that's, a, that's amazing. Yeah, and when we went to um, view Elvis as a, a little puppy at, at, at the Breeders, which was up in Shropshire, we, we drove there and... Shortly before we arrived at the breeder's house, um, the, the cars coming the other way down a road were flashing us, and there was a swan standing in the middle of the road, which was obviously pretty ill or injured or something, um, and it likely to cause an accident. So I jumped out of the car and grabbed it and put it in the car on my lap on a couple of towels. So we were driving down the road with a swan looking around going, well, this is a bit strange. <laughs> so the kids who were in the back, obviously, and loved the film Hot Fuzz said, oh, we called it Elvis. So that's how the dog ended up being called Elvis. Amazing. That's a great story. There must be something yeah. about dads. And I was going to say dads and um, oh, hit by cars. Um, my dad ended up, it's very similar. I was a kid in the back of the car and somebody had obviously hit a rabbit and dad saw it. It was stunned. So he did that. He picked it up. This is years ago. My God, so many years ago um, and put it on his lap and ended up driving home with the rabbit on his lap. So uh, I think it all came good. And then he ended up taking it back out down there to go and put it back out. And um, but yeah, I think that's really sweet. That's a proper dad story. That is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I love this. I love this. Uh, question and um, you know I, I love it if you end up telling me something that's completely new what as a vet still grosses you out because it must be something that grosses you out there's always something yeah I, I have a very um, high threshold for being grossed out um, in fact I think probably if you spoke to the other people in the practice they say I gross them out sometimes with some of the things <laughs> I do. Um, yeah I don't like fly strike I guess that that's uh, pretty unpleasant um, probably the worst smell I've ever smelled was um, a vulture 
vomited or regurgitated some stuff. That that was extremely impressive. Wow. Is that worse than hemorrhagic diarrhea? Yes, definitely. Wow. Then I do not want to smell that. That sounds disgusting. <laughs> uh, we've had um we have had skunks let let their um scent glands off in the um practice and that is pretty impressive too. I have treated a skunk and I have to say my Stevie was the most amazing skunk on the planet and never did that the whole time. But that was the one thing everybody kept saying was, does he stink? And I was like, no, he's amazing. I love cuddling him because he's awesome. <laughs> oh, wow, though. Poor you if you got that. The smell is incredibly pervasive. It's really difficult to get rid of. Oh, wow. Oh, well, I'm glad that Stevie held back then. I'll uh, thank the owners even more about that. <laughs> um, so... If time, everything was no, it, no, you know, no money, whatever, was no object, what would your dream achievement be? All oh, right. Well, I guess I have two there. Uh, one is I would really like to uh, reduce the ownership of exotic pets in the country. They have just such a bad time. And, you know, every day I'm seeing these poor animals that have got ill basically just because they're not kept right. And it is incredibly difficult to keep these things really well. And people just have no idea that that is the case. Um, so that would be good. And I have, um, in my own small way, made some effort to try and raise the profile of that problem. Personally, I think it actually just should be illegal to keep most species. Um, but uh, most people disagree with me, I think. <laughs> I think no I think it's really difficult I think that like most of these things it's a phasing you know you always have to get people used to the idea I mean you've only got to look now about how much people are actually aware now of not keeping dogs in hot cars you know in the old days it would just happened every five minutes nobody thought about it but nobody walked their dogs they'd just be let out and they'd roam the streets you know things change over time don't they and as people get more aware they get more conscious of those things and so you know there you know there are obviously some amazing exotics owners who who do all the research on the planet and they'll dedicate a whole room to them and making sure that they've got all the space on the on the earth and then you know but then those will be those owners that are also backing you up and saying well god there's also these people that are keeping a snake in a drawer in the cupboard and you just think wow that's just awful and yeah and there's and there's so much like you say that's little it's little nuggets of information that's so particular to the tiny species and you don't realize like some some species are kept in you know need cold environments but hot baths to warm up in or you know all sorts of tiny tiny little bits of information that you just don't realize and and even getting things like the diet right because you know if you're not feeding them specifically right um koala is a great example isn't it because they only eat like eucalyptus don't they so they're in danger because their food's going and if you don't know that you've got to feed them that one specific food or you can't get hold of that one specific food then yeah they're in trouble and that that's not fair so no i i completely agree with you and i think it's something that you know will hopefully change over time um i think that it's really difficult because you see a lot of you know shops pop up and all that sort of thing and um I think awareness is such a big thing and um yeah I, no I, I'm definitely with you on that and um actually a, a teacher I was speaking to once she said you know we're a nation of animal keepers rather than animal lovers and that shocked me because I was like but I love my animals and um but it did make me think it did make me think I was like wow I, you know we have got to be better and um and we can be better and yeah so yeah no i completely understand that um and you said there was two dreams what was the other one two. <laughs> oh, like to make veterinary medicine much more evidence-based a, a lot of what we do is dodgy <laughs> wow go. that was quite a statement <laughs> well, it is unfortunately it's also true I and mean, in the 19 late 80s and early 90s when i was working in america that's when evidence-based medicine really started off in human medicine it made a huge difference i was not a doctor i was a researcher but i was working with doctors every day and you could just see the change from well this is the way we've always done it to oh hang on a sec yeah we've just suddenly found out the way we've always done it actually doesn't really work very well we've got to change to that and there are hundreds and hundreds of examples of Doctors being absolutely certain they're doing the right thing, really sure they're saving lives. And then researchers come along and showed that actually what they were doing was killing people. Wow. Uh, 
or making the illnesses worse. Many, many examples of that sort of thing. Um, and if it was like that then in human medicine, it's like that now in veterinary medicine. There's things we're doing that are making things worse or just not working at all, that we have no idea that that is the case. And so we would like to have loads of research. Uh, we would like the research to be good quality because much of published veterinary research is really poor. And we would like people to understand the research. We'd like vets to be able to read the research and actually critique the papers. And vets mostly are not trained to do that well. To be honest, it's, it's really hard, isn't it? Because, um, I mean, evidence base is something that keeps coming up all the time. And I'm really, really, really keen on research as well, and particularly in chronic pain. And, um, you know, the more you look into it, and I use the words look into it very carefully, because like you say, trying to understand the papers is literally like reading jargon sometimes. Um, and, you know, the more you research, the more you realise, wow, and, you, and you'll see papers, and they've had a... a a study done on two dogs and you're like wow I mean that's literally a study on Tweedledum and Tweedledee <laughs> it's crazy so um you know but you know I understand the difficulties in the veterinary world as in that you know the funding and all that sort of thing that makes life really hard but it would be lovely to have more research out there and it, it's really nice um I do a lot of um training and webinars and stuff and when you do get to listen to one where they're bringing out this paper and that paper particularly when they start talking about how that study was done and how many animals were in it and all that sort of thing. It is very eye-opening, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, it's definitely, um, that is definitely something. I'll just finish it. I think, well, how come this ever got published? It's just, yeah. I think times are changing. It's definitely getting there and it's um, definitely changing. And uh, But it is very, very interesting. And it's always interesting having the arguments as well, isn't it? Because, you know, there'll be one person sitting on one fence and the other person sitting on the other fence. And it's like... Oh, and it's very hard to know, you know, what's the right answer because we just haven't got enough papers done. And I and I do think that's the one thing all the researchers agree on is we need more papers done. Um, and breed, uh, well, some breed specific, but other species specific as well because you can't just say that it's okay for a cat because it's okay for a dog. That doesn't work at all. So. Uh, yeah, it's really, it's very interesting. So yeah, those are those are some great goals and achievements. So. Um, uh, yeah, achievements if you can manage to pull it off. So, uh, good luck to you. Good luck to you. So, um, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna know what this is. But if you could be amazing at any sport, what would it be? Oh, you think you know what it is? I don't really have any interest in sport at all, to be honest. Oh, but you did cycling, so I was guessing at that. <laughs> oh well, yeah. I mean, I I do the cycling just to keep fit more than anything. I do. I I used to go on hundred you know, huge long cycle rides much less these days. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoy a cycle ride, but uh, I'm not uh, a competitive cyclist. I just go out and do it for uh, a bit of enjoyment and keeping fit. Uh, I'm the only sport I think I've ever um, actually played competitively uh, is squash. I really wow. used to when I was young, so uh, I guess that's probably the answer, I guess, but I'm a bit past it now <laughs> doing that sort of thing. Never. I refuse to believe that. It, I I absolutely know that there are veterans competitions out there for anyone. So um, and I said that to one of my clients the other day and he said, oi, careful on the veterans word. And I didn't know that apparently there's a senior before veterans when it comes to golf. <laughs> so um, I'm a gymnast and I, I'm classed as a, a veterans gymnast as soon as I hit 21. So I, you know, so I thought, oh, that's it. Everybody's a veteran after 21. Turns out I'm wrong. So my, my point is you can definitely go and do veterans squash. I'm sure that you can. But I wouldn't want that ball coming anywhere near me because they look painful. <laughs> it's pretty unusual you get hit. Well, it is if you're good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, well done you. So if you could do a, a live Facebook chat with anyone, who would it be? Oh, well, um, I, I have a, a, a real interest in um, sort of philosophy and the philosophy of science and uh, scientific methods and also to do with psychology and such things. So it would probably be one of the, some of the leading philosophers, people like Daniel Dennett, uh, Douglas Hofstadter, and psychologists like Daniel Kahneman. Um, so there you are, these are all people you don't know by the look on your face. 
<laughs> definitely, I'm afraid, yes. <laughs> but, well, known, well known in their field, know all the sorts of people who've written lay books about um, those sorts of subjects. So I, I, I think I'd have a great time chatting to those people. I think that's amazing. And it doesn't matter that I don't know who it is. I'm sure that somebody out there watching will know exactly who they are. And certainly your subject sounds amazing because I love talking philosophy. Um, although I'm not going to say that I'm at any high level about it at all. But I always find it amazing that the kids now, my daughter's six and she does philosophy at school. How amazing is that? That's so cool. They do like literally like the philosophy of Goldilocks. I yeah. mean, <laughs> talk about starting it early but it's brilliant it's the thing she's yeah, talked about, about doing a, a, well i think it's called pbe philosophy belief and ethics a level wow wow i mean that's just amazing absolutely amazing so yeah no that that's fantastic so are you um do you like to do the cooking at home or is it left to the wife or you know what do you like to cook if you are stuck in the kitchen it's not a ready meal <laughs> Well, but my wife and I both see cooking just as a real chore, to be honest. It's not something oh, we enjoy in any way. Um, and by the agreement of four out of five of our family, I being the exception, nobody likes my cooking. <laughs> so oh, I thank you. Uh, do very little of it. I think my cooking is fine, personally, but I do very little of it. Um, it's your taste. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Oh, bless you. Well, that's fair enough. And that's very honest of you. So um, so that's very good. Well, so, since I, I find it a chore, it, it's hardly a hardship for me. Well, exactly. <laughs> it's understandable when you get like that. I can understand it. Um, so um, tell us something that people uh, may not know about you. Uh, well, the, the, uh, the Japanese government paid me to do a tour of Japan. How about that? Wow. Tell me more. Why? Well, when I was uh, a research scientist, um, I actually just did a, a, a very trivial favour for a, a young Japanese scientist. Uh, I was living in Miami and uh, he was he actually came and visited our lab and he was going on to a, a conference, which I was going on to. So I said, well, you don't need to pay to stay in a hotel. You don't need a taxi. Just stay in my place and I'll drive you after the conference tomorrow. Uh, which was the sort of thing that anybody would do, really. It was no hardship or anything. And the next year, his boss, um, who was quite a high-up uh, professor in the, the field I was working in in Japan, actually came and found me and, and sought me out and said, oh, thank you so much for helping my young colleague last year. And we had a bit of a chat, and he said, oh, you must come to Japan, which I thought was just a sort of polite thing. Well, I, about three weeks later, I got this package on my desk of grant applications saying, sign here. Uh, so I signed and ended up doing a tour of Japanese medical schools to explain the work I was doing uh, to try and develop tests of uh, hearing in babies and about my basic science. And I spent a very um, interesting month um, traveling around on the bullet train, going to different medical schools. And fortunately, my work was way ahead of the people in Japan. So I, I, I didn't feel like a fraud. I actually did do some good while I was there. But at each place we went to, um, the professor's wife would take the day off and take my wife out for the day and do all the local tourist things while I was in the medical school. Then we'd go out to this amazing banquet in the evening. And then the next day, the professor would take us out for some, <laughs> some jolly. So it was actually quite an amazing experience. How incredible. That, that's amazing. What was that bullet train like as well? Because that's supposed to be like, is that the fastest train in the world? Uh, they are extremely fast and they are just stunningly efficient. Um, but they pull into the station, you know, if they're more than a few seconds late, that's just a catastrophe. You know, that just doesn't happen. And they pull up, there's pictures of your feet on the ground and you go and stand where the feet are, but marked on the ground. And that's where the door will be for your carriage. It, it just makes our um, train system look ludicrously um, primitive. And, and I, well, I don't think it takes much to do that. <laughs> So um, tell us a bit more about your practice as well. You know, what other amazing things does your practice do? You know, um, shout outs to any staff, really. Oh, wow. Well, we, 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 uh, it, it's hard to know when you work for a very long time in any one practice how good you are compared to other practices, isn't it? That's very honest of you. I like that. <laughs> I, 
I think I mean, we, we were a, what they call it a tier, tier three practice, our hospital practice on the RCBS practice standard scheme. Uh, we have a lovely big custom built um, building on the edge of Chipping Norton. Lovely rural area. It's a nice place to live and beautiful views out of the back of the, ho of the hospital. Um, and we're pretty well kitted up, I guess you could say. We, we have a CT scanner and high quality ultrasound and digital x-rays, as well as a radio ID unit and all the kit that you need to do um, anything with cats and dogs, basically. Uh, we, we've got some certificate holders in the practice, fantastic team of nurses. Uh, and we also have specialists come into the hospital. We've got a specialist surgeon who visits regularly. Um, and obviously for him, it's great to have a CT scanner there uh, as well. Um, and uh, under normal circumstances, we have a, a, a specialist ophthalmologist comes, um, but she's um, uh, not doing that at the moment because of COVID-19. Uh, yeah. And we also have a, an expert dermatologist come. Um, wow. So, uh, we, we can do pretty much anything. We also take uh, yeah, medicine and surgery referrals. Some of the local practices send stuff to us, partly because we've got the CT scanner and, and partly because we're capable of fixing some things some of the other local practices can't. Well, absolutely. Uh, you were nominated by Tanya um, because obviously she uses your services and thinks you're fabulous. So, um, so years ago. Years ago. Yes, amazing. So I also want to ask, what do you love about physio? Well, that's a very brave question to ask somebody who's into evidence-based medicine, isn't it? <laughs> we try very hard. I'm very aware of the research situation, yeah. hence why I said what I said earlier is, you know, I read a lot and I'm trying really hard. And uh, I myself am um, very keen to do more research and have been trying to um, get involved with that more. So, yes, I am very aware of that situation. Um, but, you know, there are more and more papers coming out there um, and, you know, I mean, it's hard when you're trying to wait for the papers, absolutely. But I know that there's evidence because I see it all the time. <laughs> and so do my yeah. clients. So, but that's, that's the, right. we appreciate it. that's the anecdotal evidence. Well, it is, it is anecdotal. But as I said, you know, for, for there's many, many examples of doctors who really thought they were helping who were actually making things worse or, or having no effect. So it is really difficult to know sometimes whether you're helping or not. Um, but in human medicine, no doubt, there's some really good, very strong evidence that physiotherapy helps various conditions. Um, so undoubtedly, there will be the same uh, for dogs and cats. But so uh, there's not a lot of evidence around to actually say that is the case. Um, and a lot of what some physiotherapist does seems to me, um, I don't know. So we got hydrotherapists getting dogs into swimming pools to lose weight, whereas I suspect actually they could lose weight a lot just as well in some other ways. But there we go. It's a very, um, yeah, it's a very big su uh, subject and lots and lots of discussion um, to be had. And um, but, you know, I, I absolutely uh, promise you there's a lot coming up, a lot uh, being done. And um, the uh, one of the groups that I sign up with, um, they do a research refresh. Um, and we talk, uh, well, basically they talk about new papers all the time. They literally go through the whole of the paper, pulling it apart in a really um, a good way for everybody to understand, which is really nice. Um, so I think perhaps I should send you some of the papers to help you feel better about it. Um, so uh, yeah, because it's, it's definitely getting more and more evidence out there, which is really, really great stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I love it because I'm sold in it. So, um, you know, don't worry, we will get you convinced and, and on it. So it's all good. <laughs> um, so uh, what's the most spontaneous thing you've ever done? Uh, I actually um, don't do much spontaneous. I couldn't, can't think of an answer to that question at all. I'm very unspontaneous, me. <laughs> oh, bless you. Oh, bless you. Was it? I mean, it might have been coming on here. You might have been like, actually, all right, I'll do this interview. Whoa. <laughs> I, I didn't really think about it. I just thought, yeah, I can do that. There if, you if go. I'm not as spontaneous, that'll do. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so um what's the weirdest dream you've ever had oh wow yeah um i was one that one that always stuck with me i don't know what the whole dream was about but i i saw a car park take off in the air and fly around like a magic carpet and all the cars were falling off it as i was watching it that was pretty weird 
Uh, and for some reason, that was incredibly vivid. I mean, most dreams, you wake up and you think, oh, that's a bit weird. You might tell your wife and, and by the, uh, half an hour later, it's completely gone. But that one's always stuck with me for some reason. Mm, now I feel like we need to get some dream interpreter watching. And um, there you go. That won't be evidence based. Um, <laughs> but um, they can sit and tell you. I mean, it sounds very Aladdin, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's very. That's a very good one. That is a very good one. So, um, what's the coolest animal you've treated? Because obviously you've treated some amazing animals. But what would you consider the most bonkers of them all? Well, oh, I don't know what you mean by bonkers. Um, I've treated some very rare ones. So, the Chuatara, which is uh, a, it looks like a lizard, but isn't. Uh, and it's the only sort of surviving member of a, a sort of group of animals that have been around since. Uh, well, for about 250 million years, I think, something like that. So, wow, uh, an interesting that's amazing. Thing. What was wrong with it? Oh, it just had some wounds around its uh, infected wounds around its mouth. Um, and uh, but you know, I've got a treat that's the thing if you're a zoo rat for 20 something years, you end up treating almost anything. Or so, we, we are treated scorpions and tarantulas and. Never treated an octopus. I'm obviously, well, I'd like to have a go at an octopus at some point. <laughs> Many of those around the middle of Oxfordshire, though. And, and I've not had anything to do with uh, whales or dolphins either. Uh, it'd be interesting to do those. But you know, I've treated the big cats and the wolves and the um, all sorts of small furry things and many, many different types of birds. That's amazing. That is amazing. I'm very. I do like giant tortoises. Oh, cool. Yeah, they, uh, yeah, Cotswolds have got loads of those, haven't they? Yeah, and uh, so, so is uh, the crocodiles of the world, too, too. Have you ever been bitten by any of those crocodiles? No. <laughs> any close calls? Not, not with the crocodiles, no. They, they can be a bit tricky to catch the big ones because you can't dart them because the darts just bounce off. Um, so you have to sort of lasso them to get their mouths closed and, and then leap on them um and they're big strong things but no I've, I've not had the worst injury i've ever had was being kicked by a horse yeah dangerous things, um, horses. <laughs> i know that's ironic really isn't it you go treating all those crazy like you know big animals and all the difficult ones and scorpions and then you get kicked by a horse brilliant <laughs> wow that's very that's very impressive um so what's your most memorable part of your career so far Oh, blimey. Um, uh, well, you, you get to see some interesting things. I, I got called out one evening by Network Rail because uh, the high-speed train from Paddington um, from Manchester had run into a herd of cows on the railway line. Uh, and that was very, very impressive. I had to drive out to some country location and walk up this track, and then we walked about half a mile down the railway line past this train. And it unfortunately not derailed the train, but all the metalwork had come off the front of the engine and you couldn't see the windscreen because it was covered in blood and rumen contents. And you'd oh, see God. little tiny specks of red stuff and then little bits of bone and then a foot over there and a bit of a leg over there. And as we moved on, there was more and more bits of intact cow. So that was uh, extremely impressive. Wow. Um, uh, that was pretty memorable. Um, yeah, sounds it. Blimey, poor you. That was an awful one. Yes, and uh, I went to a farm and a pig farm in the middle of the night once as well, and that was uh, quite um, a memorable thing too. Um, was, uh, a lot of pigs needed put to sleep, and I didn't have enough bullets and anaesthetic to do it. Oh, bless you. So I in injected, I gave them low doses of anaesthetic into the heart to, um, just to anaesthetise them and then drowned them. In, oh, in bless you. That's awful. Wow, that's quite a one to end the show with. Lots of good things too. Yes, <laughs> um, I was going to say. Non-veterinary, we, we must be probably the only veterinary practice that's been opened by a prime minister. Uh, nice. About um, five years ago, um, when David Cameron was prime minister, he's our local MP. So uh, we just finished building our big posh hospital and we wrote to him and said, well, would you come and open it? And surprisingly, he said yes. So, so uh, he, he came up in his little convoy with his... Uh, bodyguards and all the rest of it and uh spent i don't know what it was half an hour an hour wandering around the hospital and having a chat and uh very 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 good too <laughs> very nice amazing 
So I love, wanted to hear your top tip, and you had uh, two that you'd like to give, one for the vets, one for the for the um, general public. Um, so if you would like to tell us your top tip for vets, that'd be great. Well, my top tip for vets is if you're confronted with a hypothyroid cat, treat it with radio iodine, uh, refer it on. Uh, awesome. Because it's just the best way to treat it. And obviously, it's best if you send it to me, but actually there are other radio hiding units. Uh, and my top tip for the public would be don't keep exotic pets. Um, don't keep birds in small cages. Um, uh, don't keep uh, reptiles at all, if possible. That is all fair enough. So thank you so much for those tips. That is amazing. And it has been absolutely amazing talking to you. Um, I don't know if there's been issues with the questions coming through because there hasn't been any, um, which I think, but I think that might, I think there might be a problem because that's very unusual to have had nobody say anything. So I apologize because I think there might have been a technical hitch, which I will look into after this because we've had lots of people watching. Um, so anyway, Thank you so much to our lovely audience for watching. I hope you've enjoyed catching up with my, Martin um, of Chipping Norton Veterinary Hospital. Um, it's been great to talk to you, Martin. Thank you so much for joining thank us. You. And thank you, everybody, for watching. If you've asked questions, I apologize if they haven't come through. And I will have a look on the um, feed and see if they're there and get back to you. Um, and if you guys want to nominate your vet to have a chat with us at some point, please let me know. I will try and get them on here. Everybody's still really busy with COVID, but we're doing our best. It has been wonderful talking to you, Martin. Thank you so much. And I will I will leave you to it now. All Take right. care. Bye bye. Okay.